What's changed since last year? We talked basically this month in 2024. Yep. Now we're in 2025. What's happened? Okay. So I think the biggest thing that's changed is RL and language models has finally worked. Mm. Um, and this is manifested in we finally have proof of an algorithm that can give us expert human reliability and performance given the right feedback loop. Mm. And so I think this is only really being like conclusively demonstrated in competitive programming and math, mm. basically. Uh, and so if you think of these two axes, one is uh, the like, intellectual complexity of the task, and the other is the time horizon of which the task is, uh, is being completed on. Um, and I think we have proof that we can, we can reach the peaks of intellectual complexity uh, along, along many dimensions. Uh, we haven't yet demonstrated like, long-running, agentic uh, mm -hmm. performance. And you're seeing like, the first stumbling steps of that now and should see much more like, conclusive evidence of that basically by the end of the year. Mm. Uh, with like real software engineering agents doing real work. Um, and I think, Trenton, you're like experimenting with this at the moment. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most public example people could go to today is Claude plays Pokemon. Right. Uh, and seeing it struggle in a way that's like kind of painful to watch, yeah. but each model generation gets further through the game. Uh, and it seems more like a limitation of it being able to use a uh, memory system yeah. than anything else. Mm. Yeah. Um, I wish we had recorded predictions last year. We definitely should this year. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, Hold us accountable. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> would you have said that agents would be only this powerful as of last year? I think this is roughly on track for where I expected with software engineering. I think I expected them to be a little bit better at computer use. Yeah. Uh, but I understand all the reasons for why that is. And I think that's like well on track to be solved. It's just like a sort of temporary uh, mm. lapse. Um, and holding me accountable for like my predictions next year like i really do think the end of this year uh, sort of like this or this time next year we have software engineering agents that can do close to a day's worth of work um like for like a junior engineer or like a couple of hours of like quite competent independent work yeah that, that seems right to me i think the distribution's pretty wonky though yes where like for some tasks i don't know like boiler, boilerplate website code yes. these sorts of things can it, it can it can bang it out and save you a whole day yeah um, exactly uh, yeah, I think that's right. I think last year you said that the thing that was holding them back was the extra nines of reliability. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the way you'd still describe the way in which these software agents aren't able to do a full day of work but are able to help you out with a couple minutes. Is it, is it the extra nines that's really uh, stopping you or is it something else? Yeah, I think my description there was, I think like in, like in retrospect, probably not what's limiting mm -hmm. them. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is closer to uh, lack of context. Mm -hmm. um, lack of ability to like do complex like very multi-file changes yep. and like uh so, sort of like uh, maybe like scope or or of the change or mm -hmm. scope of like the task in some respects like you can they can cope with high intellectual complexity in like a focused context with a high with a very like scoped yeah. problem um, but when something's a bit more amorphous or requires a lot of discovery and iteration with the environment this kind of stuff they're they struggle more yeah um and and so maybe the the way I would define it now is the thing that's holding them back is if you can give it a good feedback loop for the thing that you want it to do, then it's good. It's pretty good at it. Mm. If you can't, then they struggle a bit. Can you, um, and then for the audience, can you say more about what you mean by this feedback loop um, uh, yeah. if they're not aware of what's happening in RL and so forth? Yes. Uh, so the big thing that really worked over the last year is uh, – Maybe like broadly, the domain is called like RL from verifiable rewards mm -hmm. or something like this, where a clean reward signal. So, so you know, the initial unhoppling of language models was RL from human feedback, mm -hmm. where you know typically it was something like pairwise feedback or something like this, and and the outputs of the models became closer and closer to things that humans wanted. Yeah. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily improve their performance at any like like difficulty of problem domain, right? Particularly as humans are actually quite bad judges of what, is, what a better answer is. Humans have things like length biases and, and, the, and so mm. forth. So you need a signal of whether the model was correct in its output yeah. that, is, uh, that, that is like quite true, let's say. Uh, and so things like the correct answer to a math problem or unit tests passing, this kind of stuff. These are the examples of a uh, of reward signal that's very clean, but even these can be hacked. By the way, like even unit tests, the models find ways around it to like hack in particular values and hard code values of unit tests if they can figure out like what the actual test is doing. Like if they can like look at the cached Python files and find what the actual test is, they'll they'll try and hack their way around it. So these aren't perfect, but they're they're much closer. And why has it gotten so much better at software engineering than everything else? Uh, in part because software engineering is very verifiable. 
uh, like it's a domain which uh, just naturally lends it to this way. I think. D does the code pass a test? Does, does the code it even pass run? A test? Does it compile? Yeah, does yeah. it compile? Does it pass the test? Um, you know, you can go on the code and you can run like tests and like you know whether or not you got the right answer. Yeah. Um, but there isn't the same kind of thing for like writing a great essay. That requires. Uh, like the question of like taste in that regard yeah. is quite hard. Like we discussed the other night at dinner, um, the Pulitzer Prize, like you know, which would come first, like a Pulitzer Prize winning novel or like you know, a Nobel Prize or something like this. Yeah. And I actually think a Nobel Prize is more likely than a Pulitzer Prize winning novel um, in some respects. Because a lot of the the tasks required in, in winning a Nobel Prize, or at least like strongly assisting in helping in, uh, the win, to win a Nobel Prize, have more like layers of verifiability built up. So I, I expect them to like accelerate the process of disc of doing Nobel Prize winning work more initially than uh, that of like writing Pulitzer Prize worthy novels. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.